Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to the impact panel, European offshore wind boom, transforming into a new era. If this is the first time we are meeting each other, my name is Molly Huang, content lead of Leader Associates and moderator of today's session. Leader Associates is international clean energy event organizer committed to renewables and a sustainable transition. We focus on solar, wind, energy storage, and green hydrogen. On July the 6th to 7th, we will also have our first wind event of 2022, named the Wind Asset Management Europe in Madrid of Spain, followed by the second Australia Wind Energy 2022 in Melbourne of Australia, the fourth Japan Wind Energy 2022 in Yokohama, and the third ASEAN Wind Energy 2022 in Ho Chi Minh City of Vietnam. And over the course, a number of digital series will also be organized to celebrate the market dynamics. Noteworthily, during our Wind Asset Management Europe in Madrid, the event is also co-located with our Connecting Green Hydrogen Europe 2022 and the Solar Energy Future Europe 2022. By doing that, we unite the hottest renewable topics on the one roof and create a green ecosystem where projects meet with capital and partners. In the following one hour, I'm delighted to open a conversation with Ibdrola for renewables and the capital energy on offshore wind boom in Europe, as well as opportunities and challenges accompanying the journey. With great honor, join me here today, I'm Mr. Pieter Durings, Global Head of Renewable Generation Equipment Procurement of Ibdrola, Mr. Paolo Famica, Head of Offshore Wind of Fox Renewables, who's now sitting in the UK, and Mr. Paolo Alcon Valaro, Head of Offshore Wind of Spain's Capital Energy. Welcome, please turn on your mic and video and please take the stage. In the meantime, for all the listeners, you are also free to raise with questions in the Q&A box. We'll try to accommodate as many as possible at the end of the conversation. And now I think we are all good and let's get started. First and foremost, can I ask all of you for a short introductory statement? It would be great if you can introduce a bit about your company, what they do in the space of offshore wind, and then some words about your exact roles and how that relates to offshore wind development. Pablo, okay. I think you can go first. Yeah, I can go first. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm Pablo Alcón, head of offshore here in Capital Energy. Uh, and Capital Energy is just a, a developer uh, to a utility, 100% renewable energy. And, and yeah, we are based here in Madrid. Uh, our, main, main, uh, uh, our main market is here in Spain and, and Portugal. But we are we are looking at other markets uh, and, and to internationalize with the offshore industry. Right. Then Paolo. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Paolo Formica. I'm the head of the offshore wind business uh, in Farc Renewable. Farc Renewable is uh, a 100% uh, energy renewable uh, asset uh, management company. We uh, operate uh, several uh, onshore assets uh, in uh, Europe uh, and uh, in the uh, US. And we recently decided to move uh, into the offshore wind, uh, starting from the countries where we uh, have a more solid uh, platform onshore. And these countries are Italy and the uh, UK. The last but not least, Pieter. So yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Molly. Um, I am Peter Dewings. I'm uh, heading up the, uh, the procurement of uh, renewable generation equipment globally at, uh, at Iberdrola. No? So Iberdrola, I don't need if it needs much introduction in, in the sector. So uh, it's a, a global energy leader no? with uh, more than 170 years of history behind us. No? We are the number one producer of wind power in the world. No? And when it comes to the renewables business, no, we, uh, we dedicate ourselves to, from the development, to the construction, up to the operation no, of our renewable assets, no, which include offshore wind, onshore wind, solar, etc. 
Great, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And to begin with, I think the biggest question today, which all the stakeholders in the offshore wind industry are eagerly to understand, is the scale of opportunity. Question to all of you, what's your expectation on the market potential? What countries you find most attractive at the moment? And how are you gonna plan for it? Um, Pablo, also, again, first. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> I believe no, no, we have like several type of markets right now. Uh, uh, offshore wind industry is blooming uh, all around the world. We have more uh, settled markets like UK, Denmark, uh, Netherlands. Uh, right now, US as well is, is getting quite, uh, quite solid and, and in Asia, Taipei and, and uh, Taiwan and South Korea. No? Uh, these are the markets who are actually right now uh, ahead uh, from from other other countries or other areas uh, uh, for ourselves here in capital uh, capital energy we are focusing our strategy in southern Europe we are based here in Spain we have like a like a privileged position to to start the offshore wind business here in the country as well in Portugal and obviously just uh, geographically that close to, to Spain and Portugal, we have Italy and Greece that we are really interested on. And they are countries which, which will be growing really fast no? in, the, in the next uh, following years. Uh, uh, we are expecting uh, to have a solid uh, legal framework uh, to start with, with, the, with the offshore industry. And, and yeah, there are a lot of interest as well. We are seeing how how big players are, are coming to these countries to, to start positioning themselves. Uh, and, and that's that's uh, yeah, our road, uh, road to, to, to work, yeah. Right, a follow-up question uh, to Pablo. Uh, most of the project will be around floating technology or fixed-based technology. Yeah, that's correct. In, in these countries, floating technology is, is uh, I think the, the uh, the only way to go, no? for example, for Spain, bathymetry and, and the characteristics of the of the of the of the of the seabed. No, we, we need to, to go for floating winds so we can just move move a bit far from from the coast uh, and to to avoid more more impact, no, more, more visual impact, for example. And and that, what it comes is like we will need to to support no? the, the floating industry to develop because right now we don't have yet like a big commercial uh, projects, but uh, we are seeing like a really, really good improvement no, in the technology and as well how, how countries or governments are supporting this technology by, uh, by having like lease auctions in, in floating sites, et cetera. That is, is something that uh, supports the industry and gives some certainty on no, the technology and what is the, the way forward. Well noted, and we'll get back to floating topic later in the conversation. And uh, the next, Peter, Ibrola is oh, a global yes. coffee company. Yeah, so so actually globally, you no, know, today, you know, today I think we have about uh, 35, 36 gigawatts you know, in, installed globally, you no, know, where the expectation is to be in 2030 with more than over than, than 200 gigawatts, you no, know? so of which almost around 70% of that no, is, is, to be, is to be installed no, in the second half of, of the decade. So, so yes, it's a, it's a bright future, I think, for, for offshore wind. No? And um, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to Iberdrola and the countries, no, we, we as a company, we started out with our first project, no, uh, which is called Western Sands, which we did together with, uh, with, uh, with Erstad, no, in the name before was done. No? And um, and since then we've been growing and expanding, no, and um, positioning ourselves in, in different areas and countries, no. So uh, we are we are now constructing, no, in uh, in also in the in the UK we are we are in Germany we're in France, no. But uh, as you've seen also in in, in the news recently, um, besides that I think it's a, we have a global strategy, no, where we are focusing on the US, no. We're focusing on Europe, no, also the Northern Europe with with, uh, with Sweden and Norway. No, we are we are looking at uh, look at Southeast Asia very much. No, we have uh, we've entered into uh, Japan, Taiwan recently in the Philippines as well. No, 
and um, and where we are now in the, also in Brazil, no, we have uh, we're looking at, at offshore. No? So it's uh, what we have is is, is a global strategy in, in these uh, these key areas. No, that we believe no are, are, are excellent areas to to proceed the, the growth and and to uh, to uh, to help no with, together with the, the energy transition that that the world needs. No? Right, and Paulo, Park Renewables is a rising star in offshore. Can you explain more about that? Yeah, uh, thanks. So first of all, uh, with respect to the offshore, generally speaking, uh, let me say that uh, I am a strong believer in this technology. I am uh, persuaded that uh, uh, offshore wind uh, will play a key role uh, in the energy transition in the next uh, 20, 30, 10, 20, 30 years towards 2050 as uh, it has all the potential to grow much more as it has grown so far. Uh, clearly, the uh, floating uh, is uh, an extra enable to exploit better the full potentiality of uh, the business and the offshore wind. We are a newcomer in, uh, in the market. We, uh, our business model is uh, a greenfield developer. So we target a market where we can uh, grow up starting from the day one. As I indicated at the beginning, we started from the areas where uh, we had already a strong onshore platform. And we tackle uh, the uh, angle of the floating essentially because that was uh, what we uh, believe is uh, was the, the, the best way to enter in, in, into the market where probably at that point in time the competition was uh, less aggressive than uh, in the bottom fix. We, the floating will remain our strong focus even uh, in the future, but uh, we will uh, do not disregard other opportunities in uh, the bottom fix. With respect just, to, uh, yeah, with respect sorry, to the market. Uh, Please, sorry. No, yeah, uh, yeah. With respect to uh, the market, uh, clearly uh, Europe uh, is a uh, uh, core of uh, uh, the strategy. Uh, South and South and Mediterranean Union, uh, Europe, essentially because uh, of uh, our background, uh, our presence, uh, as well as uh, in uh, uh, Northern Europe. We uh, uh, look at uh, other market uh, uh, as well. Uh, not only US because we already have a presence there uh, onshore, but definitely even other uh, uh, areas uh, uh, in Asia. Uh, clearly, uh, what is important for us uh, is to identify even the right partner to uh, approach the, the market. So uh, it is a combination of opportunities that uh, we are uh, looking for with the aim at uh, growing our portfolio. Right, and we, and we can all see the great potential of wind, but there were some arguments in the past December around the public support given to wind, both onshore and offshore wind. As a result of the European energy crisis, many people blame the crisis on the underperformance of wind. From a developer's point of view, um, does this crisis have any impact on you? I think we go with um, uh, Paolo first. Yeah, uh, uh, as I said, we are uh, a, a pure developer starting from uh, day one of the uh, development activities. So our uh, approach is a sort of long term uh, view on how we approach uh, projects and uh, the business. Therefore, the crisis itself does not uh, have a great impact on our uh, strategies. I believe uh, that uh, through all uh, the energy transition, we will experience uh, a number of uh, different crises. Uh, they clearly will impact uh, on uh, the energy price one way or the other, but uh, uh, I don't think they uh, might uh, massively impact on a long-term uh, strategy of uh, a pure developer like uh, uh, we are. And. Um... Um, Paolo, Pablo, sorry, do you want to have yeah. some add-on? Nothing. I, I totally agree with with Paolo on, on, on this regard. Yeah, uh, we didn't have like too much impact on the on our long-term strategy, and, and we we are purely developers. Uh, I think that the the crisis 
impact more the, the companies who have like a, a, a more settled retail business uh, and, and they commercialize in the energy. And I think the, the, the price no, of the energy uh, could have impact more, more for themselves. And, and yeah, that's all. Theater? <clears throat> yes. So we, we have seen we've seen problems with the energy crisis no with with small retailers no that that uh, that, that uh, they have difficulties and struggling no in different countries in, in Europe no um, with uh, vertically integrated companies no it has uh, been much less so no and uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, offshore wind and renewables in general no we are we're not changing anything no when it, when it comes to a strategy the strategy is there no we've been an enabler no of the green transition no for for many decades and. And, and this is not this is not changing them. Uh, later on, I, I think we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, other things. No, that uh, I think are, are impacting today. You know, which is which is COVID, which is the the, the price uncertainty. You no, know, and and uh, in when it comes to the materials, etc. You no, know, logistics. You no, know, I think that does have more of an impact on on, on today business than 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 the energy crisis that that, that, that uh, you just mentioned. Right. And if we put a crisis and uh, price fluctuation as one challenge, regulation will be the other challenge. The next question is more about regulation in Southern Europe market. I think the question goes to Pablo first. Uh, after that, Peter and Paolo can chip in. So basically, we can divide the European market into two parts. The northern part, like UK, Denmark, Norway, mature markets. While southern part, like Spain, Italy, Greece, the Mediterranean region is just taking off. Being a developer and market catalyst dedicated to the Southeast market, South Europe market, what's your perspective on the current legislative framework and uh, what you expect from the market in the next five years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Molly. Yeah, that's correct. We are, we are following really closely you know, the development of the regulations here in, in Southern Europe. Uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Greece, I think they are in a, in a similar stage in terms of of, of, uh, of a legal framework. Uh, we, we can expect, I believe, during this year and next year to have a solid uh, legal framework uh, that set up the rules of the game for the offshore wind industry. And, and that's what we are doing. We are as well giving feedback to the legislation, to the legislators. So, because obviously, I mean, they, they need support as well, no? How to deploy the technology, uh, what would be the best uh, the best way to, to go and, and our expectations is in the next couple of years regulations to be uh, ready to go and, and start the, the auctioning system uh, yeah, yeah. We, we, we still don't know how it would be no? this system the, the, the auction system we have our, our guess I, I don't want to say that my guess no? because maybe I'm misleading uh, but uh, yeah, it, it would be, I think, a, a bit different from the UK style or, or the US style. Uh, I, and, and yeah, and, and we believe in the next five years we will have something, some, uh, luckily, some, some offshore wind farm already in the water. Yeah. Right. And for example, um, in Spain, most of the projects uh, would be floating projects. Um, do you think in the upcoming auction or in the future auction that we can see? Um, a bidding system that in favor of floating, or you think that would be technical neutral? I believe, for example, in Spain, uh, I can give you the example in Spain is like the, the, the government is just considering areas where, where the floating technology is needed, basically bottom fixes out of the table. Uh, uh, that would mean that uh, we may need to, to have some support in terms of tariff, in terms of subsidy uh, to, to help not to, to push a bit this technology. Uh, on the other side, we are seeing a lot of companies who are developing great prototypes. Uh, and, and as well, uh, we need uh, as developers, no? we have a bit the obligation to, uh, to support these startups and these companies uh, to, to optimize this technology. And as well, uh, I think another point that maybe we, we can talk later on is is the test sites. No, we need more test sites. So these, these prototypes can be tested uh, in, a, in a quite uh, fast pace and we don't have to, uh, they don't have to deal now with the bureaucracy of the, of the 
uh, site selection, connection to the grid, etc. So that's something as well that we can we can improve uh, for for developing the, the floating technology. Right. And uh, Peter, um, Aprola is the big brother in the Spanish market. What's your perspective? Well, actually, I'm, I'm not a regulation expert, no. So, uh, but we have many colleagues of mine are, no. And uh, but the, the thing is here, no, as Paula also pointed out, no, we have we have floating in Spain, yes or yes, no. So, um, in, when it comes to offshore, no, that's the, that's the solution, no. And and based of that, no, we lag a little bit behind, no, of other European countries who had the opportunity to, to uh, in Europe no, and, and, and around the world to have the, the opportunity to, to build out no, a bottom fixed no, and, 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 and get lessons learned out of that auction systems no, that they are doing. So the, uh, the, the only thing that I, that I see here is that I hope that uh, the, here locally in Spain, no, that uh, we, they take very much the lessons learned no, uh, from, from the other countries that we have around no, and that we come to a a good frame, no, that that enables no the uh, the offshore wind industry here in Spain. Right, and a follow up question to you as we look ahead into the future, um, is that whether we have enough capabilities to realize this promise. Um, uh, uh, as mentioned in our poster pre previously, we have the 60 gigawatt target by 2030 for offshore wind and the 300 gigawatt target by 2050 in Europe very deadly number and the announced projects are much, much bigger than the operational ones. How's the region's appetite on gigawatt offshore wind plan impacting the supply chain development? Mm. I think the question goes to you. Yeah, okay. So when it comes to supply chain impact of those volumes, no, I think um, the, the good thing about offshore wind is that is it's a, a long-term plan business. No? This is a, when you compare that to, for instance, the, the opposite, which is, a, which is the solar business, no? it's almost a spot business. Right? So uh, what happens with that is that we've seen due to COVID, no? transportation issues, no? and raw material problems. No? We've had real bottlenecks no? inside the solar supply chain no? that actually uh, peaked up pricing no? and, uh, and impacted really the supply chain and uh, the viability no? of, of many projects globally no? um, uh, due to that spike and, and the supply chain issues that you have. No? When, when you then go to, uh, to offshore wind, no? then the good thing is that is, this is a long-term vision no? where you several years in advance, no? the uh, final investment decisions are taken no? to go ahead with projects no? and the whole the sector as a whole no? is not planning more no? in, a, in, a, in a coordinated way no? what, what needs to be going on and, and the investments that needs to be taken. Both industries, no, and uh, offshore and, and, and solar are, are, are capital intensive, no, industries, no, and um, the but the good thing is that, no, is is the uh, the long term frame that we see, no, that allows for planning. But what is true, no, is that last year, no, in the, in the year before, no, we have seen, no, the uh, the results. If you look at now at the the, the preliminary announcement from investors, for instance, and Siemens Gamesa now with the, the, the results that they presented, no? and many other companies in the sector, no? that it's a, it does have had an impact no? on the numbers. No? It's difficult to cope with the, the uh, uncertainties no? that we've seen in, in the past year, two years. No? But on, 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 a, on a general level, no, it's a, it's a, I think it's, it will smoothen out. No? And, um, and and I think it's uh, it will not affect no the uh, the, the build out no of, of what we need to do. Right. Um, a follow up question. I also did some numbers in European market. Like for example, in U UK alone has approximately 120 gigawatt potential by 2050. And if we put the number in a global context, that would be 1400 gigawatt by 2050, including growth growth um, in Taiwan, in Japan, in South Korea, in Australia recently. Do we have enough suppliers? And uh, with regards to competition on installation vessels, cranes, et cetera, what, what's Ipsola's strategy to, to manage a resilient supply chain? Well, uh, every, company, every company 
managers um, supply chain you know what they see best fit with the strategy that, that they want to do you know we are a global company you know and, and we work at the global level you no know? and we manage our supply chain at the global level you no know? obviously with with the, the size that uh, that of the projects you no know, that uh, are secured you no know, for for Iberdrola, you know? That, that it it gives us a position where, where we can obviously work together no and, and strengthen the, the partnerships no with our suppliers no which i think it's it's very much needed no to have an excellent relationship on the supply chain side no in order to make this happen it's not it's not the availability as such no it's also it's also innovation no it's also about um, knowing no what, what you're doing and, and and later on we'll talk a bit further on floating no which is still many many things need to be done understood and uh, and to paulo sorry about late congratulations fuck won the latest scott wayne bidding uh, what else do you see as bottlenecks for the for the oh. industry to thrive great yep. manpower etc no, yeah, you, you mentioned it, the one which uh, clearly, in, in my view, is uh, uh, a point that uh, all the industry has to uh, address. As Peter uh, rightly said, uh, uh, the uh, offshore wind is a, a, a very long term business. Long term means that you have to plan exactly what you have to do, because if you fail in planning, then you suffer much more than. Uh, any other business uh, at a later stage. With this respect, uh, if you like, uh, is not dissimilar from uh, what uh, the uh, dynamics in, in oil and gas uh, projects uh, are. To manage properly the planning uh, and uh, all the activities you need to uh, put in place uh, to uh, set up uh, correctly and address correctly and manage all the risk related to such a massive capital intensive uh, uh, projects, uh, you need uh, skilled human resources. I believe uh, this, is, uh, this is going to be one of the major bottleneck uh, of the industry will face uh, in the uh, next year, especially if uh, we target the magnitude of gigawatt uh, you uh, indicated there will be a fight for securing uh, the experienced and uh, skilled uh, resources. I see this definitely as uh, one of the areas uh, we have to focus on and uh, where part of the competition uh, among uh, developers will be uh, uh, defined. Uh, with respect to uh, the supply chain, uh, clearly, uh, there might be uh, a number of uh, bottleneck uh, in the process. This will depend on uh, the different technologies and uh, how they will uh, develop it. But clearly, raw materials, uh, uh, lack of capacity in uh, fabrication yards, as well as uh, in uh, dedicated uh, vessels, these might be all uh, during the uh, execution of the project, uh, some uh, uh, bottlenecks, uh, which the developers has to face with. I see that probably in the future, uh, uh, the market uh, power will move towards uh, the supply chain in, in a way different from what uh, we have experienced uh, uh, so far. And therefore, this will have uh, an impact uh, even uh, on uh, the uh, uh, developer economics uh, and uh, on uh, the financing, how the, uh, the, uh, the, the lenders uh, will uh, back the projects. Uh, so the, the, the clearly, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, uh, a business so we, which definitely will change a lot uh, uh, in the future. We cannot uh, foresee all the changes, uh, but, uh, you know, in uh, adapt uh, the market, as the market will adapt, to uh, uh, these changes, there will be a time frame in uh, the, if you like, in the adaptation uh, that uh, will uh, uh, will uh, make some bottlenecks uh, here and there. Right, and another challenge um, would be greed. For example, in your Scotland project, um, the offshore wind is generated uh, off off the coast of Scotland, but the electricity will be consumed in London and. Um, southern part of uh, the UK. Do you think EU needs a more coordinated approach on transmission lines? Or do you think what 
enabling frameworks should be in place for the industry to scale up. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 now I, I won't talk now specifically about uh, uh, the Scott Wind uh, and uh, uh, because in any case we are talking about the UK, which is not now part of the EU. So, but anyway, generally speaking, no doubt that uh, the grid development is uh, another potential uh, bottleneck. Uh, we know that massive investment uh, uh, are requested there, uh, essentially uh, everywhere. In uh, almost all the market uh, we face uh, as a developer uh, in uh, our uh, uh, risk matrix uh, and uh, uh, assessing the countries, uh, the grid is always uh, an issue that uh, uh, needs to be uh, tackled. Uh, with that respect, uh, uh, yeah, if uh, uh, you can rely on a strong government plan, is definitely uh, uh, an upside. This is something that uh, you might find uh, in uh, certain countries in Europe, uh, some others uh, are uh, somehow behind the curve, uh, uh, but definitely that, that, that is uh, 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 an area where uh, an extra effort uh, is uh, requested. On the other side, as uh, I am uh, uh, optimistic in nature, if you like, uh, and looking at uh, the EU, uh, the uh, next generation funds, uh, are uh, a pillar uh, the national governments uh, can uh, rely on and uh, I'm confident that they will uh, take this opportunity to make uh, uh, the right step uh, and uh, the, the right investment they need in order to uh, progress uh, towards uh, a, 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 an energy transition which must take into account the offshore wind and all its challenges. Understood. And also as Paolo just touched on that, uh, on the point, that technology may also be a bottleneck as we move further from shore. After all, we don't have that many development and operating experience on deep water. Um, the question will go to Peter first and then to Pablo. So um, Peter, what's your perspective on technology lines or what emerging technologies or products that you are looking into at the moment? Well, when, when following up a little bit on Scott Wind, no? where also Iberdrola, um, no? we won we want five, uh, seven gigawatts of which uh, five gigawatts in floating together with our partner Shell in this case. No, so um, in um, in here, no, I think in in the, the most technology, no, that uh, obviously in, in the bottom fixed, no, there will be many many improvements, no, to uh, to to bring no the, the the LCOE down to to where we need to be and make project life, no, because uh, following up a little bit on on, on before on the supply chain and also what the what we see you now that um, basically when when capex you no know, is is expected you no know, is, is going up this year at least you no know? so uh, and and this is something that uh, that obviously has an impact today and uh, but we need to work on on, on how to manage that you no know, in the in, in in the future you no know? because um, obviously there is a, we, we strongly rely you no know, on our supply chain you no know, to, uh, to to innovate together you no know? And uh, because it needs to be through innovation, no, that LCOE goes down, no, because uh, we will have uh, improvements. Obviously, the, uh, there's also a positive aspect, which is volume, no. So the sheer volume has a has a positive impact, no, to some extent, no, to uh, to uh, to supply chain and cost, no, until you come obviously to a bottleneck, and then you have uh, the other way around. It's also true, as what Paolo, Paolo says, I coincide that we go more to a we will go naturally more to a supplier market. No, as we are, as uh, basically as, as things are shifting, no, in in the uh, in the in the scale, no. So when when it comes to innovation, I think in in, in floating wind, there's, there's still a lot to be done. No, we, we need to discuss. No, which float we say we're gonna put in there. No, we need to uh, we need to talk about um, interfaces. We need to talk about warranties. No, there's there's uh, many things. No, that still need to be invented. No, let's say no. And, uh, and to come to standards, not on, on an industry level and, and together with, uh, with uh, obviously not all developers out there and, and, um, and, um, and, and the supply chain. Right, uh, and Pablo, um, you have this amazing engineering background. What do you think are the most critical technical challenges that you have in mind? And what's your solutions around it? May you explain more about that? Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, well, first of all, you were talking a lot about bottlenecks. Uh, I believe as well that bottlenecks offer opportunities. 
And, and on this regard, I think that uh, uh, the, the message that we are transferring from capital energy to the supply chain here in Spain is like this is the, this is the right moment to take some risk, no? Because this industry is happening, and, and we are trying just to uh, to to get the most of it, no? For for the country and for the supply chain of, of the region where we are going to to put our our wind farms. Uh, as well, said that about technology. Uh, th there are there are quite a lot of challenge but but as well no? they bring opportunities and you can see how they are uh, how we are uh, finding a lot of companies who are innovating a lot uh, we have first of all this this test size that i was talking before uh, we need to increase the number of test sites so these companies can can develop their technology faster and in and, and they can and we can like uh, uh, meet the targets no? that the governments have uh, have basically set up and uh, more specifically to the to the technology in in floating uh, i believe we will need to uh, well obviously the floater no uh, the, the floating foundation we need to uh, to optimize uh, uh, the solutions uh, uh, basically we need to agree the whole industry in a in a reasonable safety factor let's gonna say to not overdimension these type of structures that would as well uh, facilitate no, the work for the for the supply chain, and we we would meet uh, the targets not to deploy all this technology. Another challenge could be like the, the cable protection, for example. We've seen some uh, some issues no in bottom fix uh, with with the cable protection and the uh, dynamic uh, motions. Uh, certainly, we will have to. Uh, uh, to take quite quite a lot of consideration uh, with the floating technology on this on this regard, uh, as well uh, with the floating technology, we have this new uh, challenge that is the mooring mooring lines and a mooring failure. We will need as well to uh, to have a deep look on the on the level of redundancy that we would like in in our offshore wind farms, uh, and and to have like a reasonable. Uh, safety and, and safety like uh, factors so so we don't over dimension these moral lines uh, but as well we we feel uh, we feel comfortable no with with the uh, with the arrangement and and maybe yeah another one important would be like the the interface no between the the floating solution uh, or the floater with the with the wind turbine uh, we are seeing right now no the trend in the industry is kind of is kind of developers getting together with with floating developers with floating technology uh, companies uh, but uh, yeah maybe maybe we need to to have like more uh, conversations between the wind turbine manufacturers and the floating uh, these floating tech companies so they can offer bundle solutions for us developers uh, would facilitate our work a, a lot, no. If we have like uh, like proven solutions with the wind turbine and the floating solution uh, all together, obviously that's that's an, an ideal world, no. But uh, that's something that would help us. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, what's the? Can you forecast? Can you forecast the future LCOE trend for floating technology and um, um, a brief comparison uh, comparison with uh, fixed based a little bit. Well, uh, in numbers, I, I don't want to, to risk myself, no? but uh, no. I think, yeah, uh, uh, well, we are seeing like the LCOA right now, LCOE right now is a kind of $150, uh, megawatt hour, something like this for floating. Uh, uh, companies and these startups are working really hard to optimize the structures and bring down this LCOE. Uh, as well, uh, the, the regulators, they need to feel comfortable with the technology and as well, uh, uh, so they, they can support this with, with a special tariffs, but not that, that much, no? Uh, so, so it would be kind of a compromising solution at the, the first uh, floating wind farms. I believe, uh, just to, to give you an number, we've seen some, uh, some prototypes, no? That they are, they are claiming or, or they are, yeah, uh, to bring down the LCOE uh, below $100 uh, megawatt hour. Uh, well, uh, I believe that for that we need as well as scalability to have like big wind farms, not in a prototype, 
uh, and, and also we would need uh, yeah, yeah, to have like a, a robust uh, uh, supply chain to, to bring down uh, from, from 100 euros or, or dollars a megawatt hour. Yeah. And uh, Peter, do you agree with the numbers? Well, okay, without going into the numbers, the, the fact is you know, that Today it's more expensive no? to do uh, to do floating, but also the the um, at least the expectations are because it's only demo projects that are out there, no, not uh, not big projects. And when we look at 2030 horizon, no, if I'm not mistaken, no, the uh, the Global Wind Energy Council is predicting a 16, 17 gigawatts, no, by 2030, no, in um, in in, flo in floating wind, no. So um. Maybe it's optimistic. We can we can see we discuss if this is optimistic or not. No, but in any case, it's a small number. No, it's a, it's a, it's about it's less than ten percent. No, of what we have on on the the, the complete global build out. No, obviously no. There is there is uh, some some uh, floating. Or there's some there's some effects. No, of, of the global supply chain and and the, and the development cost etc. Not to go from bottom fixed to the floating. So uh, it uh, there will be some advantage there to the the overall development. But it's uh, it's still no small scale no and, and still some some the typical learning curve is still not there no so which which actually uh, will make in any case no it's uh, it will remain more expensive than than bottom fixed no for some time no in order to, to reach the same numbers. Understood. And uh, after discussing market potential, regulation, technology, cost, I think we can also touch a bit on the commercial side of the projects that be bankability. The question goes to Paolo. Um, FUC is previously known for its expertise in onshore wind, and I believe you are fully aware of the importance of bankability, in which securing a long-term offtake contract is key. What's FUC's road to market strategy? For example, CFD, green corporate PPA, green hydrogen even. How do you plan to get project financed? Okay, so <clears throat> the project, uh, achieving the project financing, uh, especially for uh, floating projects uh, is uh, actually uh, uh, you need to address a number of different issues. The first, uh, you indicated a couple. The first one is uh, the uh, technological aspects that uh, Pablo and Peter uh, discussed and uh, I fully agree with their uh, uh, assessment. Uh, and the second one is uh, clearly the route to the market. Uh, at the present, uh, we are based even on our uh, experience in the onshore. We uh, clearly consider uh, all of the ingredients as essential to the uh, project deliverability. Uh, CFD or any other form of subsidies definitely at this point in time is essential, especially for floating uh, is uh, something that uh, uh, probably no project can fly without uh, an element uh, uh, of that. I hope uh, and uh, that that uh, we will be able to deliver a project uh, even uh, without a 100% support uh, of uh, CFD or any other form, uh, but definitely uh, uh, these forms uh, will be part of uh, uh, the whole equation. PPAs. Uh, is uh, uh, the other uh, element uh, we have experience uh, in the offshore in approaching the market through uh, uh, commercial uh, PPAs and definitely we are not scared to keep it uh, as a part of our portfolio in managing uh, the long-term price uh, risk. Uh, hydrogen is definitely the other route and uh, clearly the bigger are going to be the project, uh, the more the three, solu the three solution can uh, uh, work together. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hydrogen is uh, something that uh, you need to address uh, very carefully. Uh, uh, again, uh, um, very often uh, it is uh, uh, indicated uh, as a sort of magic solution when uh, you do not have uh, uh, others. Uh, I believe uh, that hydrogen uh, will be, the green hydrogen uh, will be part uh, 
of uh, the uh, offshore wind uh, uh, full uh, structure, but uh, uh, it must be uh, pay a lot of uh, uh, attention, a lot of analysis has to be run and, uh, uh, you know, to be sure that uh, the numbers remain, remain solid. So uh, I, I believe uh, clearly a mix of the three will be essential, especially if you deal with uh, uh, a multi-gigawatt uh, project. Uh, for a smaller project, uh, uh, CFD plus uh, PPA is something we will feel comfortable about. Right. And uh, do you think that there will be more significant developments in the road to market strategy in the next five years? I mean, clearly, uh, it depends on uh, how the uh, LCOE will, uh, will 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 develop. It. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, I see there are uh, massive room for uh, uh, improvements. The history of uh, the uh, renewable technology goes in that direction. Uh, uh, solar PV uh, onshore had the tract as well as uh, the bottom fix. Uh, I believe there are still room for uh, uh, material improving in the in the bottom fix but clearly the room are even bigger in in, in the floater uh, uh, the, so the more competitive uh, the uh, lcoe will be for uh, uh, offshore wind the bottom fix uh, and uh, and uh, 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 floating the less we will need uh, 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 subsidies uh, or for more subsidies contribution in, in terms of percentage uh, to uh, to the project. It is a, a long journey. It's difficult to make a guess uh, now or just uh, uh, throw out numbers on what the uh, the bottom line uh, will be. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, I believe that the uh, the industry's focus uh, and now even the big player uh, move into the uh, floating. So this is a strong indication that uh, uh, progress uh, will be making the next uh, five, 10 years. Right, and recently there are also innovative projects on floating wind plus hydrogen. Um, I, I think that's because we all need a new energy storage solution. Storage is uh, quite a hot topic these days, which has been an important necessity for renewable projects to get great connection. And also in 2021, Spain um, announced its national energy storage strategy, for example. Would battery power to X or offshore wind to hydrogen be an area that you are interested? Uh, the question to Peter and uh, Pablo. Okay. Well, maybe I, I... Uh, here, obviously, um, storage storage is a, a, a key element you know, when, it, when it comes to uh, to complement renewables. You know? that's, uh, that's that's more than discussed, I think, also in, in, in the industry you know, and on, on, on all levels. You know? um, the, the question is, to, to, to which technology do you go you know, to, to provide the storage? You know? Today, you know, what we have, and, and, uh, and, and if it as a company, you know, has um, obviously in there, we're also investing in pump storage you know, with hydro, you know, which is a which is obviously is a, is a key element you know, to the storage, uh, the storage that we have. We are we also looking obviously at, at batteries, no, and uh, to some extent, no, combined with solar, wind, etc. No, we're doing hybrid projects, no, to that extent in, in different uh, countries in the world, no. We even invested in 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 a company, no, in Australia, no, uh, for instance, very recently, no, uh, and in uh, in a storage company. So it, in the end, no, it's a, it's part uh, that we want to be, no. Also, green hydrogen, no, it's also in uh, it's it's starting up, no, and um, there's uh, there's also still a lot of questions now on, on the uh, on the uh, the efficiency on the uh, on, on the electrolyzers etc. No, but uh, the the strategy is there. No, so as as a company, no, uh, green hydrogen is for us. It's uh, is also a key element. No, we're looking at in, in, in different combinations. For now, no, we're building out in Puerto Llano, no, which in, in I think by March, no, we will start producing. No, the, uh, the 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 green hydrogen, no, which is a uh, the, the, it's going to be one of the biggest or the biggest plant, no, to date in, in, in green hydrogen to supply to industrial customer, no, and it forms part of of a pipeline, no, to uh, in in, uh, in, in, a, in a roadmap, no, into green hydrogen in, in Spain and the rest of Europe, no. So uh, and when it comes to offshore, so uh, yes, so we're, we're looking at 
uh, different ways no to uh to uh to work in that area no and um and then and, and it's it's definitely something that uh, that is it's it's a new route to market no and uh and it helps with the storage no but um it's it's uh it's on a case by case no basis that that in offshore that that we are looking at that now Pablo, do you have something to add on? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as Peter said, no, we are as well investigating uh, hydrogen uh, storage uh, and, and and new new types, no, of, of energy. Uh, I, I think the trend right now in Spain is to hybridize uh, uh, onshore wind with with storage or. Uh, or solar, uh, we believe that uh, they are quite compatible. No, the the solar energy and the and the onshore wind, for example. Uh, when when you have kind of well, when you have sun, you uh, you don't have wind and vice versa. So uh, so you still have no the the right uh, to the to the grid connection, and you need to to optimize this this connection as much as possible with hybridization. This is possible, and that's. That's what we are pushing in here in, in capital energy. Uh, uh, in terms of offshore wind hybridation here, uh, right now, I, I would say let's gonna go one step by step. No, uh, first of all, let's gonna start with a commercial scale uh, uh, floating offshore wind farms, and later on we will see uh, how how we can hybridize with with hydrogen. Uh, that is something I know that there are some prototypes already working on that. Uh, and, and obviously that's something that we will uh, consider carefully. Yeah. About right. the storage, well, uh, obviously uh, uh, is is the same, no? As with onshore wind and, and solar, uh, uh, you need like to optimize this grid permit that you have to connect, and, and with with batteries, with storage, this is possible, as well. Uh, uh, the, the batteries or, or the storage of the energy uh, can have quite quite a, a green impact on the on ports, the carbonization of ports, the carbonization of some industries uh, where where they are quite electro intensive, no, and that's that's something that we can uh, we can as well support with this uh, sustainability of the of the energy. Yeah. Great and. Uh... Um, one last question before we open the floor to audience. Uh, it's actually an Easter egg question. Uh, I'd like to give the opportunity to our panel members. Uh, if you have one question for your panel colleagues, who do you want to raise a question to you and um, what would the question be? Um, I think we'll start with Paolo. Do you have any questions for uh, Pablo or Pieter? Yeah, thanks uh, for letting me start so it is uh, easier because I will choose probably Pablo. Uh, my question is uh, if you can elaborate a little bit more on what uh, your strategy in uh, Spain are with respect to uh, development uh, offshore wind projects. Mm. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Paolo. That's confidential. No, uh, well. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I Our strategy is, is 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 quite actually simple, no? It's like we are we are supporting right now the regulators with the with the legislation that they are about to issue. Uh, we are engaging with the supply chain, uh, like actually going one step ahead, no? Uh, from the legislation and, and going to the supply chain, just uh, letting them know that this is happening and they need to be coordinated between themselves uh, and and as well with ourselves, just to. Uh, to a smooth things, no, and and, and that brings all the FID uh, problems, etc., and bottlenecks of the supply chain that you were talking. And and and, and basically, that's the, the two main things that we can do. And now, when uh, another thing that I believe is quite important, and we have some obligation, the developers is not to not to. Uh, uh, randomly uh, speculate, not, not to speculate, but maybe just not to uh, basically s uh, start like uh, developing offshore wind farms if we don't know if that would be a appropriate area or it would be legal basically to, to deploy the technology there because then I think it's, it's counterproductive to the, to the whole industry and it creates a bit of chaos, no? noise. So basically what we are doing is, is just considering where the areas the government 
will will allow uh, to deploy the, the offshore wind farms and just starting to uh, the site selection. No, I, I think that that's the most important uh, and and obviously engaging with the with the supply chain. So we have the support of the of the local industry and as well we can support uh, we can support them. No, uh, bringing investment uh, to the areas. Uh, Thanks. Thank you very much. Right, um, Pablo, it's your turn. What question? Okay, I, will go with, I will go with, with Paolo as well. So I, I give it back the, the question. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we are looking and we are we are investigating Italy no, as a as a really uh, uh, attractive market. Uh, it's, the, it's difficult not to to follow up the the, the developments on the regulation. Uh, this letter of intention that we saw uh, uh, that you have to submit the letter of intention. We don't know if that brings you like legal right to later on uh, to put a bid in place or not. Uh, I, I don't know if you can bring some clarity no, about the about the regulation in, in Italy or is too much that. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty challenging. <laughs> yeah, correct. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Italy, uh, has been always a, a, a pretty complicated uh, uh, market uh, uh, because the, the players uh, are many and uh, uh, the interferences uh, are, are, are a lot at uh, local level, uh, regional level, uh, uh, national level. Uh, there is, uh, however, uh, I believe uh, a genuine uh, efforts uh, from uh, the central authority to streamline as much as possible uh, the process to uh, give uh, comfort uh, to the uh, investors uh, that uh, this can be the right wave to take. Mm. Clearly, especially uh, in Italy, there is a, a, a strong push uh, coming uh, from uh, the next generation uh, EU funds. In Italy, there is a common uh, uh, ground and uh, uh, understanding that uh, this is an opportunity we cannot fail. Mm -hmm. Energy transition in terms of uh, where the investment has to go and how to best uh, deploy the uh, EU next uh, next generation EU is definitely uh, an area where all uh, we look at, and with that respect, uh, offshore wind has uh, a number of uh, upside to offer, especially with respect to all the let me call them NIMBY uh, spillover effects uh, that uh, you might have uh, with uh, uh, other uh, 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 other technologies. Mm -hmm. So to make uh, the story uh, uh, short, I believe, uh, first of all, it is true, historically Italy has been a very difficult country to make uh, uh, capital intensive uh, 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 investments, no doubt. Uh, however, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, indicators, uh, which, uh, uh, including the fact uh, that uh, there is uh, a, a genuine, uh, a strong push from uh, the central government to move and to and to take the opportunity, which uh, make me uh, more uh, optimistic uh, uh, with respect to the offshore wind development uh, in Italy, uh, comparing uh, with uh, uh, alternative alternative investment opportunity. I mean, my recommendation is that probably, yes, you need someone with uh, uh, boots on grounds that uh, can help you uh, in uh, uh, navigating uh, into the complexity of the countries, which uh, unfortunately probably will remain. Mm. Okay, thank you, Pablo. Pablo, I hope you are satisfied. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I will talk with him privately and see if I can, <laughs> I can get I'm sure we will. Uh, I'm sure we will. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I see you are smiling in a yes. very happy way. Well, just then. conscious of time, because just time, I, no, no further questions for, for, for Paolo. And Paolo, just wishing, wishing all uh, best of luck and 
and uh, this this market is a is a well, we are we are competitors no but we also sometimes partners in this no it's a and uh, so in any case no uh, we probably with the past will cross no and uh, and and best of luck thank you same to you same yeah thanks. thank you all and uh, i i think one last question that we can have uh, before we wrap up the whole conversation uh, it's actually a question from our registrants from japan um he, he mentioned that um what do you think are the good political practices that made europe a success by now um also do you think these kind of the uh, legislative frameworks can be replicated in Japan or other South um, South Asia countries. Sorry, Southeast Asia countries. Yeah, I, I, I can take it if you want or... Uh, Please. Yeah, well, uh, uh, South Asia, uh, South Asian countries, uh, uh, each country you now have their, their, their regulations and have their a way to approach the offshore wind industry. Japan is really like regulated and, and is kind of more, more complicated, to be honest. Uh, 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 Taiwan is more kind of, uh, yeah, is, is who, who step in first is, is who, who goes. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, flyers, no electric uh, uh, business license to grant it, et cetera, but nothing is, is yet uh, materialized. So, uh, yeah, and, and Taiwan, I think, is, is a bit ahead, no? So, um, yeah, uh, I think uh, they need as well to do some, some homework in terms of regulation, uh, uh, these countries, and to, and to clarify. I think that we are in a very similar stage in a lot of countries, and, and it's kind of the, uh, the, the government are, are the ones who can take the lead no? on, the, on, the, on the issue. Yeah. Right. And uh, if Drola, you are also targeting the Asian market, I should, I should say. Uh, you have any comments? Though I know you are not a um, regulation expert. But, well, look, uh, we've just seen the results from, from round one in Japan. No? Yeah. So um, now we're working with our projects as well towards round two. No? And um, the, the thing is, obviously, no, there's, uh, there's a lot of some, some clarity is missing no? on, on, on how to to work uh, towards that, no, that, that affects technology to be chosen, um, the, the, the actual uh, actual layouts of the site, etc., cetera, no, and, and many other things, no. So I think it's that uh, the importance is always clarity, no, so that you know what you're going for, no, and this helps, no, to, to, to build out and to plan and to do the engineering, etc. Good. And uh, Paolo, do you have anything to add on? No, oh, I mean that, uh, uh... The fact that uh, other new Asian markets uh, uh, comes after the uh, the European one offer them uh, the opportunity to, uh, to learn from mistakes. So clearly, uh, the uh, especially Northern European country were extremely good in developing uh, uh, the business. Uh, clearly, there were a number of. Uh, conditions that allow them uh, to achieve the point. Uh, the the, the um, government approach, the Northern European government approach was definitely part of the equation why uh, uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the debt market uh, developed first, but clearly uh, during the process there are some mistakes and who comes later can learn from that and can try to make even better. Excellent. And as we reach the time limit, uh, I'd like to thank you again for um, Paolo, Piotr, and Pablo's insightful discussion. I think we can go much longer, but I'm afraid that we have to come to an end due to time limits. It was truly great talking to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank bye you. Bye. bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have bye. a good day. And to all the listeners, thank you so much for being us. Um, it's great to meet you all virtually and hopefully we can meet in person next time again. As always, if you have any questions remain, don't hesitate to reach out to us at Leader Associates. Also, the recording will be shared with you later this week, along with a brief summary. If you'd like to cooperate on our content, please feel free to drop me an email below at molly at leaderassociates.com. And appreciate again all your participation. Have a lovely day and take care. Thank you.